Welcome back to Making the Case, everyone. On Tuesday, President Joe Biden unveiled his latest nominations to serve as U.S. attorneys across the country. The list of nine includes three black women who, if nominated, will become the first to serve as top federal prosecutors in their districts. Well, joining me to talk about Tuesday's announcement and tell us why this is so important to all of us is BNC legal contributor, Paul Henderson. He's also a veteran prosecutor. We love having him here. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm so happy to talk to you about this black excellence. Usually we're talking about, you know, some heavy duty things, but this is awesome. I want to get your reaction to this. I mean, I was elated just seeing those names and seeing the volume. This is a lot of nominations that he's talked about, and it's really significant. This is almost a third of the jurisdictions that exist in the United States. And to see black people and African-American women at the forefront of these offices is crucial in redefining how justice is interpreted. It's very, very important. A lot of these folks have come from National Black Prosecutors Association, an agency that I've been a member of forever. They've been around since 1983. And to have those folks at the forefront of the conversations that define what justice looks like in those jurisdictions, it's, it's huge. It's, it's really big, especially if you look at the context of what those decisions mean in terms of their leadership in the jurisdictions where they'll be serving, presuming, of course, that they get through their nomination process. But this first step is, is pretty significant. Yeah, that's half the battle, right? So, Paul, um, we said three of Biden's nominees are women of color. Keeping that in mind, help us understand what the historical significance is of these nominations. Yeah, I can make it very clear for folks just by talking about cases that we've all been talking about, like Ahmaud Aubrey, right? Like he went through three separate offices before that case was actually charged. Part of the reason is the subjective and intransigent decision that prosecutors have when they charge cases, if at all, and how cases are charged. And so right now, that's more relevant than not, even in cases that you and I have been talking about, like the R. Kelly case. This is a case like, you know, people have been talking about R. Kelly and what he's been doing for over a decade. But at the federal level, the U.S. Attorney's Office finally took a stand and represented that case and filed that case. So there are pretty important decisions that can be made at that level. And it's really important that we have a voice that we have a representative at the table that reflects disenfranchised communities, specifically African-Americans that are disproportionately affected by our criminal justice system. So it's a big step towards reform. It's a big step towards accountability to have faces that look like disenfranchised communities and people of color making those decisions in those seats. It, this is a big deal. Oh, absolutely. So, Paul, the president nominated a total of nine people. I understand that you've read their bios. So I need you to give us your critique here uh, and let us know if any of these candidates stand out to you. I, I mean, honestly, the ones that stand out to me are the ones that have been active in the National Black Prosecutors Association that we've seen over the years. I joined that organization when I first started practicing law. And honestly, as we're connecting the dots about the significance of these nominees, one of the things that I think may be reflected in this volume is the vice president, Kamala Harris, who has also been a prosecutor. Now, obviously, I was her chief and worked for her for a number of years, but she was active in National Black Prosecutors Association as well and is intimately familiar, not just with the candidates and their background, but on the significance and the importance of having African-Americans being at this seat in the table for the federal government. There's so many issues that we've been talking about for weeks and months that these roles will be having their thumb on the decisions of how they are interpreted that are going to matter at a local level for many, many jurisdictions. It's, it's really groundbreaking, it's significant, and I'm hoping that we're able to follow through with some really good appointments in the near future. Yeah, let's talk about these appointments because, of course, we know that just because someone is nominated, of course, it doesn't mean that they are going to get it. So tell us about the process because we know they don't, they're not automatically guaranteed to get the position. So uh, the first step is, is lengthy, isn't it? 
It is, even before they get to the nominees. So in many jurisdictions, those nominees come from the Senate office, the federal Senate office, for those states. And they nominate the folks and are, submit them to the administration. So the Biden-Harris administration is evaluating those names. And even in a city like San Francisco here in California, you know, we've never had a black woman nominated by a sitting president to this seat. And San Francisco is not alone in that bad uh, record. There are so many other records where, that are waiting to be broken, but Biden's nomination of these folks is a big deal. And the nomination itself is significant. And the process now is they have to pass and, of course, be appointed. But presumably, these are folks that have already been vetted, uh, which is how they got the nominee in the first place, and have gotten the selection from Biden as the nominees. But I, I'm more excited about not just the nominees, but about the subject matter that they will affect by the decisions that they make moving forward. Welcome back to Making the Case. Each week we tell the stories of people on death row. Tonight, we want to tell you about Rodney Reed. He has spent more than 20 years on death row in Texas. Now, Rodney, who's a black man, as you can see, he was convicted of killing a white woman that he had an intimate relationship with back in 1996. It's a crime he says he did not commit. And since his trial, substantial evidence has surfaced pointing to Rodney's innocence. And based on that evidence, the governor of Texas granted Reed an indefinite stay of execution just five days before his execution date back in 2019. As of now, Rodney's execution is on hold but he remains in solitary confinement on death row. To talk about Rodney Reed's case is Jane Pucher, his defense attorney and also staff attorney for the Innocence Project. Welcome, Jane, we appreciate you joining us. Jane, Rodney spent the last two decades on death row for a crime he says from the beginning, from the beginning he said that he did not commit this. Walk us through this case. Yes, yeah, from, from day one, that's exactly what he said and uh, what seems to be borne out by all the evidence that has been developed in post-conviction. Um, so a woman named Stacy Stites was found murdered on the side of a road in Bastrop County, Texas. Um, the initial suspect in the case and the suspect for many, many months into the case was her fiance, a man named Jimmy Fennell, who was a police officer um, who had very violent tendencies. There were lots of indications in the police records that existed at the time that he was abusive towards her, controlling, manipulative, um, and lots of reasons to strongly consider him as the suspect in the case. Um, for months, the police looked at him. He failed multiple polygraph examinations. He did a lot of very suspicious things in the aftermath of her murder including emptying his bank account um, and giving false statements to different investigators. But the police stopped looking into him entirely when they discovered that three intact sperm cells, spermatozoa, uh, were found inside of Ms. Stites' body um, after, at her autopsy. And when they eventually did DNA testing on that spermatozoa, it came back to Rodney Reed. Now, Rodney's reason for his sperm being inside of her is that the two of them were having a consensual sexual affair, a tryst. Um, as you pointed out at the top of uh, this segment, Mr. Reed is a black man. Ms. Stites was a young white woman in a small Texas town in the late 90s, and she was engaged to a white police officer. So it's no surprise that they were keeping their affair a secret. Um, there were people who knew about it, some of those people did come forward at Rodney's trial, but the really remarkable thing is that in post-conviction over the past two decades, the number of people who have come forward to say that they knew that Rodney and Stacy were sleeping together. Um, these are people who were friends with Ms. Stites, who have no reason to help Mr. Reed whatsoever. Um, the state built its case on the false premise that sperm cannot survive intact for more than 24 hours. Um, because Mr. Fennell, her fiance, gave an account of Ms. Stites' whereabouts in the 24 hours before she was killed, they made it impossible for his story to be true. They used scientific testimony to make it seem like what he was saying, which is that they had had sex about two days before, uh, couldn't have happened. 
what we have learned in post-conviction, including at a recent evidentiary hearing, is that that is just not true. It is false testimony. Um, the science shows very clearly that sperm survive intact for days, sometimes five, six days, even a week. Um, and so Rodney's uh, account that he had had sex with Stacy about 48 hours beforehand is entirely consistent with the scientific evidence. And what we've also learned in post-conviction is that there were numerous people, including Ms. Stite's friends, who knew that Rodney and Stacy were sleeping together. Okay, Jane, this, this is uh, heavy stuff, pretty detailed. Do you really think this comes down to race, though? I gotta be honest. Is that really the factor here that put this man away and, and they were about to kill him? I think it's a big part of it. I mean, Rodney was convicted by an all-white jury um, the state very clearly at trial argued throughout, including in closing argument, that there is no way on earth that a nice girl like Stacy, a nice white girl like Stacy, would have been sleeping with a person like Rodney, meaning a black man, um, and made it seem like his story, his account of what was going on, that they were seeing each other, they were two young people, you know, sleeping together and having fun, just couldn't be possible because the facts of the world would not allow something like that. Um, and instead of admitting that, you know, a, a grave, grave mistake was made here, instead of recognizing that the person who was the initial suspect in this case, somebody who would go on uh, as an active police officer to sexually assault and kidnap somebody while acting as a police officer in 2008, um, instead of recognizing that he is the likely person who did this, uh, the state continues to insist that Rodney, who had no motive to harm Ms. Dites, uh, was the one who did this instead. So in 2019, he actually came within five days of being put to death. How scary. And, and then the Texas Court of Appeals indefinitely stay his execution. So is it normal for them to make that call so close to the actual execution date? It happens, um, unfortunately, and obviously, as, as we know, sometimes it doesn't happen at all. Sometimes the execution goes forward and people who are innocent uh, are, are never brought to court to have their moment to clear their name. And the you know irrevocable uh, thing that is the death penalty happens and takes their life. So thankfully for Rodney, he was spared um, with you know just five days left until his execution was scheduled, but it was an absolutely terrifying time for him and for his family. And to be clear, it's still a terrifying time. There is a stay currently. Um, we had an evidentiary hearing in July where we were able to bring forward a robust amount of evidence pointing to Mr. Reed's innocence. Um, we believe very clearly, um, but it's gonna be in the, the hands of the Court of Criminal Appeals eventually to decide if they think that's enough to overturn Rocky's conviction. Um, so we are waiting to see, and you know we will hopefully have an answer to that in the coming months ahead. But you know this is this is the thing when we speak about the ultimate punishment of the death penalty, particularly when you're speaking about people who are factually innocent. Um, it can come very close, and sometimes uh, you know the relief that is needed to stop this machine of death doesn't come into fruition, and we lose people. It's so hard to imagine. It's so hard to Jay, imagine. You talked about Jay, how the state's about entire the case state's against Rodney was built on Rodney. faulty science. And the state's own forensic scientists, they've actually since admitted to making crucial errors in their testimony. So can you tell us what were their mistakes? Sure. At trial, there were multiple uh, uh, witnesses who came forward to testify that, as I said before, sperm can only survive intact, meaning whole with the heads on, for a very short period of time. And the experts said that, and that was repeated by the state, to make it factually impossible for Rodney to have had sex with her about two days before. Um, that is false testimony. That is not true. It's not supported by the scientific literature now or in 1996, 97, 98, when this case was being prosecuted and brought to trial. Um, that was known to be incorrect then. The fact that sperm survived for days and that's a regular occurrence means that Rodney's defense that he was saying then and is saying now um, is entirely scientifically possible, whereas the state was arguing it wasn't. Um, the state also argued incredibly, because there is no basis in science to do this, 
um, that Miss Stites was sexually assaulted at the moment that she was being strangled to death. It's a very graphic image, a very graphic thing to repeat. But that was an argument that they made very, and very repeated. Graphic. Very graphic, in closing argument. So Jane, um, there is no so, science to support that. So, yes. Do you actually talk to him Jane, though? Talk to him. I mean, he's on death yes. row. You talk. What does he say? When last did you talk to him? Spoke to him last week. Speak to again, him again, hopefully at the end of this week. You know, you mentioned that at the beginning of the segment that he is in isolation, and he is. He has almost no contact with anybody from his family, especially with COVID. His access to the phone is even more limited than it is normally. But thankfully, he is allowed one 30-minute legal phone call a week. So I am able to speak with him every week and check in with him. He's doing okay. You know, he's been in there since 1987. He's been since how, he got arrested. How can somebody be doing okay with this hanging over their head? He is an incredibly strong person. That's all I can say. He has a wonderful family who stands with him. He has hundreds, thousands of supporters around the country and around the world who know that he's innocent and who believe in him. And I think that he relies on their strength. And he has overcome and survived so much uh, since the late 90s, and he just keeps taking one day at a time and knows he has a lot of people behind him. Well, I'm glad to hear he has uh, support like that. Well, thank you so much for sharing this story. Defense lawyer and staff attorney for the Innocence Project, Jane Pucher, we appreciate your time. And we have more Making the Case coming up after this short break. Stay with us. <laughs> 